right, so one more time, just would like to bring greetings to each one of you in the sweet and matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm so glad that we are again in our eighth session of our historical journey of the church. How do you feel about this journey so far? Do you think that this journey was a blessing? Do you think that you need to know this journey? You know, this is a this is a journey that will show us both the good things as well as the bad things. From good things, we will learn to do something good. But from the bad things, we will learn not to repeat the same history again. So historical studies in itself is very important. If you are not aware of history, we will keep on making those mistakes which has already proven as wrong and right. So today, we will jump into a very important part of the history. Do you know in the whole history of Christianity, this part is one of the most important part. So far, we have covered thousand years of Christianity. So it's been like we covered in last seven sessions, we covered thousand years of the history of church. Now we are going forward from thousand years. So where we stand today is in the middle part of our history, okay? We started with early Christianity. We started with Jesus Christ's disciples and then the apostles and then apostolic fathers came to church fathers, came to ecumenical councils. And from there we came to Constantine. And after Constantine, how the church started drifting away from the biblical teaching and we entered into dark ages and from dark ages we have come to the middle part of the history and this middle part is very interesting and the reason why it's interesting is this we are going to share one of the most important piece of the history and that is called as great schism it is also known as East-West Schism or the Great Schism. We have not seen such a big schism or division in the history of church in the entire history, in, in its entirety. So in 2000 years, this is known as the Great Schism. So we will be discussing about Great Schism. Great Schism or the Christian church splits. The church is officially splitting into two. We know up till now, like in all these thousand years, many churches left the mainline churches. For example, Mars from, from Pauline Christianity, if you remember the map, if you remember the timeline from Pauline Christianity, Marcion Christians left. Then slowly from their Arianism Christians, Christians left. Then from them Nestorians left. And then slowly, slowly so many other isms or heretical teachings left the church. But there was not a great schism. Church was never split into two. They separated themselves or the mainline church you know, rejected them or we can say mainline church excommunicated them. But this was for the first time in the history, the church was getting divided, split into two. And this split is called East-West split, East-West schism. So if you are writing notes, make sure you write the notes that exactly what I'm explaining. So Great Schism is otherwise known as East-West Schism or the biggest division in the entire history of Christianity. When I say East-West, Constantinople, Constantinople, if you see this one, Constantinople, it stands as towards the East side, okay, East side. So, 
In 1054, Christianity splits into the Roman Catholic Church in the West and Orthodox Church in the East or Eastern Orthodox Church. Western Roman Catholic Church or Eastern Orthodox Church. For the first time, church got split. Now it's very interesting if you look into that history and I will share in a bit how that got in. The leader of Roman Catholic Church in the West is the Pope. This is how Pope became very official. So in 1054 AD, after 1054 years after the year of the Lord, the church got split into two. West side is known as Roman Catholic Church. East side is called as Orthodox or Eastern Orthodox Church. It is also known as Eastern Catholic Church. Okay. But it is normally Eastern Orthodox Church. The leader of Roman Catholic Church in the West is the Pope. Whereas the leader of Eastern Orthodox Church in Constantinople is Patriarch. So in, in Orthodox Church, they call as they call their leader as Patriarch. And in Roman Catholic Church, they call their leader as Pope. So Patriarch along with bishops of the empire. Now, let me take you to the timeline. You remember this timeline. Hopefully you remember this timeline. It is known as the ancient church. Ancient church. And the reason is that was a time when actually the church started and it started flourishing. So this is called ancient church. From 500 till 1500, this church is known as medieval church medieval church from 500 till 1500 the church is known as the medieval church so when you study history you will study it as in three different parts the ancient church the medieval church and then definitely is one more coming in but medieval church can again be divided into something else i will show that and the third part from 1500 Martin Luther and the reformers jumped in and the church is known as the reformed church. So it was 1580 where many reformers came in. John Calvin, you know, and Martin Luther, Wycliffe, uh, Swingley, you know, all those people jumped in. So then the church phase is known as the reformed church. So you will always hear in history these three terminologies. One is the ancient church, second is the medieval church, and third is the reformed church. You know, medieval church again can be said as early middle ages and high middle ages and late middle ages. So if you think about 500 to 1000 is early middle age. 500 to 1000 is early middle age. From 1000 to 1200, it is high middle age. And from 1200 to 1500, it is late middle age. You know, just to, just to keep this in your mind when you study history. Now, you know that there were seven church councils. Uh, the, the first two councils, Nicaea or Nicaea and Constantinople, these two councils dealt with explaining Trinity. So Council of Nicaea or Nicaea or Constant, Second Council of Constantinople in 381, both were centering on explaining Trinity. You know, they made Trinity very clear. And it was because of Trinity and about the existence of Jesus Christ, the early church got split. Now, the second one, third one, fourth and fifth one, they all were talking about person of Christ or Christology. Person of Christ or Christology. 
It was in 431 and 451 when they were, they were talking about monophysitism. You know what it is, miaphysitism. You have, you have studied about that. So it was during that time they were discussing about Jesus, whether Jesus has, Jesus is one person uh, with uh, two different nature or one person or one different nature, whether the nature is mixed or not, th those are called monophysitism or miaphysitism. So you know that uh, the church, the early church, Church of East, they got separated because of that. So all these councils were talking about explaining the person of Christ. Now, the last one, by the time when they reached 787, they started discussing about icons. You know what do you mean by icons? Icons means the symbols, symbols. So their theme was what symbols can we accept? Can we accept cross? Can we accept saint symbol? Can we accept serpent? Can we accept fire symbol? So can we accept the symbol of Mary? Can we accept the symbol of saints? So by 787, now they were not discussing about Trinity. They were not discussing about Christ. They were not discussing about Holy Spirit. They started discussing about many other things. So if somebody asks you, you know, do you believe in church councils? The answer from my side will be, yes, I believe in church council, but only the first one or maximum the second one, that's it. Because in first and second, we had a very clear picture of what Bible was, a clear picture of who's father and who was son and who was Holy Spirit, how the church function, what is the role of pastors, what's the role of church, what is the role of believer, what is eternity, what is second coming of Jesus Christ. All those things were explained very clearly in the first council and even maximum the second council but from the third council onwards infiltration started many other things started getting in so you know there are there are people who ask us hey do you believe in the councils uh, uh, my answer is yes i do believe in council the first is the hundred percent definitely i believe the second a little bit of that but after that i don't i don't i don't go and read and bother what the other council is talking because Finally, they started talking about icons. Think about this. This is how the church got drifted. Friends, let me tell you this. Everybody will not tell you the truth. People may hide the truth, especially mainline churches. They want to hide the truth. They hide it for reason. They don't want to show this ugly thing. They don't want to show this wrong thing to common people. So they will hide it. But let me tell you. You as an historian, you can analysis, you can make an analysis of how church was drifting. From the theme of Trinity, they started talking about whether Christ is God or not. They started talking about who, why should we worship Jesus Christ. They just started talking about the person of Christ. They started talking about the nature of Christ. And see what happened. They ended up in icons. Such a cheap talk. They completely drifted away over the period it doesn't it didn't happen in one day over the period of 500 years over the period of 700 years so friend what i am trying to tell you is that it is easy for us all to drift away to slip away in course of time if we are not adherent to the real teachings of bible friends Today, we have enough opportunity to look back and find what went wrong and what went right. So, I will tell you, you all are blessed. I am blessed to look back into the history and to, and to find that, yes, I am blessed that I am not the part of Drifted Church. I am a part of the original church. How many of you consider yourself that you are the part of original church? I am not the part of Drifter Church. Friends, let me tell you, when people talk about tradition, they have a high standard of talking about tradition. They look forward with pride and, you know, with, 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 with pride in their heart that I belong to such and such tradition. But I want to tell you, as Paul says, we should not be sticking into such tradition, such 
foolish traditions that has drifted away. No matter what this name would be, what this big name would be, there will be millions of people who are followers of those traditions. But let me tell you, Christ is more concerned about our heart if we are adherent to the teachings of Jesus Christ, which was the real teaching. How many of you can praise God and magnify the name of the Lord that you belong to this real church with the real teaching? Friends, let me tell you, Jesus never recognized anybody who had a Christian heritage or a lineage. Even Jesus never recognized, if you're thinking, well, back in the days of Jesus Christ, there were no Christians. Well, in, in, in that case, there were Jews. Jesus belonged to Jewish community, right? He was born and raised in a Jewish community. But think about when he was talking about Jews, he never talked. He was never talking high about Jews. He always spoke that there, you know, people who are called as Abraham's sons are not literally Abraham's son. But all those people who believe in the God of Abraham are the sons of God. Actually, what Jesus was saying, it is not the history or the lineage that makes you the son of Abraham or the son of God. It is the faith in God that makes you the sons and daughters of God. So friends, you will see and hear so many talks like, oh, you don't belong to this church? You don't belong to this traditional church? Oh, so you belong to a church that has no root, that has no connection, that is not under the lineage. You have never got, you never got that hand, you know, uh, hand anointing and laying off of hands. You have broken up lineage, so you are not a Christian. There are so many people who talks like this. But let me take the words of Jesus. They are not the Christians who got the laying up of hands who got the lineage and heritage, but they are Christians who believe in Jesus Christ and who are the children of God. No matter you come from a, which community, you, may, you might come from a different caste, you might, you might come from a dis, different community, from a different language, from a different continent. That doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. You are a child of God because God has chosen you and you have accepted him as your personal savior. So friends, I want to tell you, refute any theology, refute any talk that comes to you and ask you about the greatness of tradition because traditions are not great. Faith in Christ is the most important thing of life. Can somebody just praise God and magnify the name of the Lord? Put your comments and say that, thank you Lord, for I am the part of original Christ. I am the part of original Christian. My history comes right from the cross. My history doesn't come from the split church. My history doesn't come from the drifted church, from the dark age church, the church of icons. My faith comes from the Lord and the Christ who was crucified. Amen. So, going forward, so let's talk about East-West Schism. Now we are in 1054. We are in 1054, okay? 1054. So in 1054, the church got divided. It is called East-West Schism. So Constantinople is in East. And Rome, Italy, it is in West. This, that's why it is called Western Church. And this is called Eastern Church. Constantinople is Turkey. Today is Turkey. So those Middle East part, Turkey and the, you know, the, the areas then. Remember, they, these were the places where actually Paul spread Christianity. So the whole Christianity divided into two. The Bishop of Constantinople shall have the primacy after the Bishop of Rome because his city is New Rome, Canon 3, Council of Constantinople. Now listen. 
there were many reasons why they had this division and we will discuss on that one too why did the church split what was the reason this church got split let's go to the reason so here is western church that is roman catholic church eastern church that is orthodox church eastern orthodox church why did they get split or divided western church they believe church is over the state you know they won't agree to this but in their tradition the pope started anointing the emperors church decided the laws and the rules of the state church was over the state but eastern church or in constantinople or in the middle east area eastern area the state is over the church this was the major two difference so in rome they always believed and they emphasized that church should be over the state well they believed that church already started ruling over the world now here is where one of the most important uh, thing that we all need to understand remember christ never meant to rule this world in his first coming when people asked him that he would be the king of the jews jesus refused jesus never wanted to be the king he never wanted to rule this earth because he said my kingdom is heavenly kingdom there will be a time when jesus will rule over the earth as he's ruling over the heaven too he will be doing that but it was not this time but roman when roman catholic church when it became strong in west in rome the catholic church became very strong they they started ruling over the state they started making rules and impose rules over the states where in eastern side they said state is different church is different state has a bigger authority over the premises and church will come under the state so that was the biggest difference and the difference is pope is the final authority so in rome the catholic church in catholic church pope became the final authority nobody has a say council doesn't have a say bishops doesn't have a say whatever pope says that is the say so that was in western church but in eastern church it is not the patriarch but church council is the final authority council became strong here but in west in roman church pope was the final authority now in western church the another important thing was the theology was framed only for theologians that means common man has nothing to do with theology they don't have to discuss theology they don't have to know theology they just have to listen what the pope says and what the bishop says so theology was completely for theologians whereas in east theology was for everybody for everybody theology was for everybody now in west in roman churches or roman catholic churches celibacy demanded for nearly all possessions by that time celibacy became a major major thing what do you mean by celibacy not to marry celibacy means to to be away from being married you are not married so bishops popes they all have to stay single they cannot marry so celibacy became a very very important thing that time so that was another thing now what happened also in in eastern church marriage was permitted except for bishop unless someone really want to become bishop then they will be they will not marry but rest all the small pastors and leaders would marry but in western roman church all of them were asked not to marry so that was another thing that we could see in the church
in uh, Western church, this was a good thing. They were opposition to icons. There were people who started opposing icons. But in Eastern church, veneration of icons were there. That means in Eastern church, they started, you know, worshipping icons. They started talking about icons. They started, uh, you know, uh, talking about you know, icons are very important. They they wanted to have these icons because they feel like this is the most important thing that they are missing in their Christian life. So icons were very important. In Western church, adopted Philoc clause. If you don't know what is Philoc clause, this is another important piece of instruction that you all need to know. What do you mean by Philoc clause? So Western Church accepted Philoc clause. What is Philoc clause? If you don't know, let me explain it very simple. So there is a triunity. We all know Father, Son and Holy Spirit, right? Triunity, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Based on a verse in John chapter 15 and verse 26. Bible says when the helper comes or when the Holy Spirit comes. Whom I will send to you from the father. That is the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father. What does that mean? See when the helper comes. Or Holy Spirit comes whom I will send to you from the Father. Jesus is saying, I will send to you from the Father. That the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. That means the Spirit of truth will proceed from the Father. Now listen, this is important. From Father, the Spirit comes in. That is what Bible says. Late, so in, in Nician Creed or in the first council of Nicaea, they all accepted this very much. But going forward, Roman Catholic or Western Church said, it's not only Father, but because it, Son says, I will send to you from the Father, they said, Son is also, Spirit is also proceeded from the Son. So earlier, they said it was, the Spirit proceeded from the Father, but later on, they said, Spirit also proceed from the son. Then what happened? Eastern church objected that. They said, no, no, no. The Bible says the spirit of truth will proceed from the father. Why did you add son to that? That adding son is known as philoc close. Philoc close. Adding son to this close. It was father that was accepted in Nician creed. So in Nicene Creed, it was only father. Later on, they added son. That is called adopted philoc clause. But Eastern Church objected to the philoc clause. Hope that is easy for you, right? How many of you understand that? Is it easy to understand? So Eastern Church objected to the philoc clause. Now, we are going to talk something, another important thing. So this is called East-West Schism. They both, oh, oh, another thing I will tell you what happened is this. Uh, they had so much of differences, right? M huge differences came in between Western Church and Eastern Church. So one time what happened is Pope visited Constantinople. So Pope from the West visited Constantinople in the East. He went straight to the patriarch over there and then he threw a, a file and said, you are excommunicated. He was so furious. He was so angry. He just went to the patriarch and he's, he threw the file on their face, said that you are excommunicated. The patriarch became also angry. He was also angry. He said, if you have the authority to excommunicate us, we excommunicate you. So both the churches excommunicated each other. So 
You should know this. If somebody comes and tell you we belong to West Roman Catholic Church or somebody comes and tell we belong to Eastern Orthodox Church, well, both of you are part of excommunication. So in a way, there is not a single church that was communicating now. Both the church excommunicated it. Pope excommunicated Patriarch and the whole Eastern Orthodox Church. So Eastern Orthodox Church in return excommunicated West Roman Catholic Church. In a way, both of them were excommunicated. So if somebody talks about laying up of hands, lineage, history, then I'm sorry to say it has a bad history. It has a very bad history. None of you are in good standing because both of you excommunicated each other. So in that way, everybody is excommunicated. So who is not excommunicated? We who believe in Jesus Christ, who believe in the Son of God, who believe in triunity. So, well, nobody can excommunicate us. We are not the part of excommunicated church. We are the part of communion church, communion with Christ. We have a communion with Christ. Can somebody say amen to this? You know, you need to know the answers. When somebody come and talk to you, talk back to them and tell them, well, you know, you can always tell them in a very polite way. Well, I'm not the part of excommunicated church. I'm the part of communion with Christ. How? By faith, I am in communion with Christ. So how many of you feel proud today that you are not the part of bad history? You are not the part of a depreciated, excommunicated church. You are not the part of a drifted church. You are a part of the real communion church with Jesus Christ by faith. If Christ said, anyone among you who is not even a Jew, but have trust in God, is the son of Abraham and son of God, then you and me are the children of God because we have trusted this God. We believe in triunity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it is through faith we are saved, not by lineage, not by history. Somebody need to praise God and worship God today because now you know you are in a right way. When my eyes were open, I had the confidence and very much confidence. There are people who will come and who will tell you about the wrong teachings, about the wrong histories, polish their history and say that, oh, you are, you don't have Moron, you don't have Laban and Moron and you know all those things and you don't have the lineage and you don't have the history and you don't have the tradition. Tell them, well, you have a bad history and bad tradition, but we don't have Moron, we don't have all those things, but we have laying, we have laying up of hands of Jesus Christ upon us because he said, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And so we are free. If you are free and in freedom, just lift the name of the Lord, praise God, magnify the name of the Lord, worship the Lord, and give God glory, honor, and praise. So that is another part. Another thing is, going forward with this, now the next thing, a very bad phase of the history, a very bad phase of the history. Have you ever heard the name called Crusades? Well, I have heard crusades. What crusades you have? Well, we have three days crusade in our in our church. We have three days crusade in that, that place. We have crusade in America. We have crusade in that. Well, yes, you all have heard about crusade. But do you know what is real crusade? What is real crusade? Okay, so sit tight. I'm going to teach you what is real crusade. So crusades. Do you know that the church believe in the teaching of Jesus Christ? If someone slaps you on one face, show them the other face. This is the teaching of Jesus Christ, right? Unfortunately, after the great schism in 1100s, in 1100s, Christian terrorist group started. You think Christians never had a terror group, right? Unfortunately, you are wrong. Christians had some extremist, extreme terrorist group. They are called crusades. They fought for the faith. I'll tell you why. What is the rational behind the, behind the crusades? 
So Crusades began in 1096. Why Crusades began? You know that in 680s, between 600 and 700, Islam started. And Islam started, they started imposing Islam faith by force. By hook or by crook, they started killing infidels. They started killing non-Islamic people. They started beating non-Islamic people. They started, you know, covering all the countries one after another, killing Christians and Jews, converting everybody into Islam. In this season, in 1096, some of the Christians in the East, with the help of West, they thought, why don't we have a military, a Christian military? Why? To stop the Muslims. So Muslim invasion of Anatolia, or Anatolia. Anatolia is in Turkey. So Muslims, they completely invaded Turkey. So you know that Turkey was a Christian area. So Turkey was a place where where Christianity prevailed for a long, for long, long years, almost close to 700, 800 years. Pauline Christianity was very much flourished in Turkey, all over, Ephesus, Colossus, all those churches that we talk about, the seven churches, all those churches were in, 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 in Turkey, not just seven, there was hundreds and thousands of churches in Turkey. Muslims invaded Turkey and what they did, they killed every Christians and they asked the Christians and Jews to leave the country. If they want to live in the country, they have to get converted. And if they won't get converted, then they have to leave the country. This is real history. I am not camouflaging the history. This is a known history. This is a real history. So Islam invaded and they converted people by force. It was most of the Muslims who embraced Islam or most of the people who embraced Islam, they didn't embrace Islam for the matter of faith. They embraced Islam because of fear. It was not by faith. It was not because Islam faith was very attractive. It was not because the teachings of Islam was very attractive. It was because of fear they all got converted. So today when you see all over Muslims who were converted at some point of time, now they are Muslims. Now they might have faith and teachings and they might be reading all those books. But early Muslim community, they got converted not because of the teaching, but because of the beating, because of the killing and because of the persecution, because of the fear. So Christians thought, why don't we have a military? If Islam got, you know, into all these countries and they could invade Christian countries and Jewish countries by power, by beating, by killing and by, you know, by, by, by force creating fear, we can also do that. This is how crusaders started. Those are Christian military. And the reason Byzantine Emperor Alexios I appealed to Pope Urban II for mercenaries. Now listen, Byzantine em Emperor, who is Byzantine Emperor? If you want to write it down, please write it down. Byzantine Emperor were in Eastern country. They were in Constantinople. So Byzantine Emperor were in Constantinople and they were Christians. Now Muslims started invading in this Constantinople or Turkey area. So Byzantine Emperor thought, let me have a group of people who will help me, a group of Christians who will help me. So Byzantine Emperor from East called Pope in the West and he said, Pope, because you are over the state, we are not over the state. Church is not over the state here. So you are over the state. So give us some mercenaries. Give us some arms, some weapons so that we can fight. So Byzantine Emperor Alexios, he asked few Christians to come and help the country. That's how a Christian military was made. So Urban II's call to arms 
lot of weapons were sent and crux crux is a greek word for crusade this is how a crusade was formed that means there is a state military and now they have a second military who are called believers military or christian military they were common people so what happened is people's crusade 90 percent of the participants were general population who were crusaders 90 percent of the participants were general people they were common people this was a second line military other than the main military this was an extra help for the emperor so common people came together they took weapon in their hands in the same way how islamists took weapons in their hand or any other extremist any other terrorist group who take weapon in their hand christian military took weapon in their hand and what they did they killed the jewish community massacre of jewish community huge jewish community were killed but then they were warned by alexios II. then crusaders annihilated by turks they were very very angry because of what is happening in turkey so what they did they went and start killing all the non-christians all the non-christians baron's crusade is one of the other name of the crusade baron's crusade you know they were people from france italy germany and england common young christians they all came together they said we need to fight we need to fight they all took weapons they all started killing people in the name of religion unfortunately Christianity has a bad history of killing other people. So most of the times we don't know this history, so we don't we don't claim it, we don't talk about it. But crusaders were Christian military from France, Italy, Germany, and England. They came together, took the weapon, they started killing infidels or killing those people who are non-Christians. They all assembled in Constantinople. That is, you know, Alexis called them all back in Constantinople. They called them back in the Eastern Turkey. And what they did, they imposed oath. Oath were taken. Right? And what happened? They went to Nicaea. You know, Council of Nicaea happened in Nicaea, right? So, after long years, after almost close to 700 years, now Nicaea was completely filtered by Islam. Islam took over Nicaea by this time. So what, what they did, crusaders did. Crusaders went and seized Nicaea. They killed all the people there. They took them up and they took Nicaea back. And then what happened? This, they went to Antioch. In Antioch, it were all Jews and all Muslims. So crusaders went over there and took Antioch back. So in a way, what crusaders did was they got all their churches back. They got all their buildings back. They killed all those people and got the church property, all those Christian property back. You know, well, uh, whether it is good or bad, you can decide. But, uh, you know, what I know from biblical theology, a Christian can never take a weapon in the name of faith to kill others. Then what happened is that after seizing Antioch, uh, they, they Byzantines, they all left. Byzantines emperor said, well, we got Antioch back. So they left because their work was done. But crusaders went on to siege Jerusalem. So Jerusalem was in the hands of Jews. Jerusalem where part of Jerusalem was in the hands of Muslims. So crusaders went and seized Jerusalem. They took over Jerusalem. That's how if you go to Jerusalem now, there are many churches like Hel Helena, 
built few churches there, but that was taken back by Muslims. But then crusaders came and took that building back. And when you go today, those church of nativity and everything is there. Crusaders came and Byzantine emperors came. They rebuilt the church. They redecorated the church. So when you see the church today, it is a redecorated church. It is a rebuilt church. So because crusaders went and get, got that back. You know, there were visions that say, said we should go and get that. Kingdom of Jerusalem, Tripoli, Antioch and Edessa. All these things were taken back by crusaders. Jerusalem, Tripoli, Antioch, Edessa, all these things were taken back. Now, there were a number of crusades that happened, okay? I want, what I want to show you is very interesting. At the end of this, I will show you one important thing. See, it started in 1096, right? It started, crusades started in 1096. From 1096 to 1099, establishment of kingdoms, Jerusalem, Tripoli, Antioch, Edessa, they all got it in their hands. Second crusade happened in 1145 till 1149. Okay, four years of crusade. What was the attempt? Attempt was to retake Edessa because Edessa again went back into the hands of non-Christians. They went to get it back, but they failed. Second crusade was a failure. Third crusade, 1189 till 1192. Again, three more years of crusade. What did they do? Recapture of Akari and Jaffa, but failed to recapture Jerusalem because Jerusalem again fallen back. So Jerusalem was again, again it went into the hands of non-Christian. They went to recapture, but they could not recapture. That was third crusade. Fourth crusade happened in 1202 till 1204. Two years of crusade. Crusaders sacked Constantinople. They finally, what they did, they fought against Christian. See, they started with fighting against non-Christians, ended up in fighting against Christians. So here, the history is proving, history is proving, anything that is not from God will not survive. Anything that is not from God will never survive. Do you remember one of the best statement of Gamaliel when Jews started, you know, persecuting Christians, Gamaliel, a Jewish rabbi, stood up in the Sanhedrin and said, you don't have to persecute Christians. If this is from God, no matter how much you persecute, it will flourish. And if it is not from God, you don't have to persecute, it will finish by itself. Friends, I want to tell you, any ministry that you do, if it is from God, it will prosper, it will flourish. And if it is not from God, no matter what you do and how many people help you, it will not flourish, it will not go far. If you believe, say amen to that. So what happened by fourth crusade, started in 1906. This is a funny thing that I will tell you. Started in 1096, by 12-4, the color changed, started to destroy non-Christians, ended up in destroying Christians. What a bad history is that? There was another crusade called Albigensian Crusade. Crusade in southern France to stamp out Cathars who held to perfection and poverty. There were some uh, believers, Cathars, who who think who thought about being perfect, you know, by through poverty. So crusaders came and said, "You are wrong. Nobody can be perfect by pro poverty." They went and they killed them. There was another crusade called Children's Crusade. All the kids came together, young kids, teens came together in 1212. They made a crusade, and they they attempt to march to Holy Land. They all gathered together to, went to go to Holy Land, go to Israel to get the things back. Unfortunately, they failed and nothing could happen. There was a fifth crusade. Crusaders attacked Egypt, but they were defeated. They were defeated. Sixth crusade happened in 1228. 
Frederick II of Holy Roman Empire given Jerusalem. That time again Jerusalem was taken in. Sixth Crusade. Seventh Crusade was attempted by Louis IX of France to take Egypt. But again they failed. Crusaders failed. 1254 Crusaders failed. And that was all the Crusaders were done. Crusaders were done. What I'm trying to tell you. It started 1006, right? It started 1006. 1096. Started in 1096. Ended in 54. Just say how many years? 60 years? Total 60 years. In 60 years, they thought, Christians, some of the few Christians who thought, they can win the world with weapons. In 60 years, they were finished. In 60 years, they were finished. But think about, let me remind you about 300 years when persecution came and they thought they can destroy Christianity with persecution of 300 years. 300 years they persecuted, but Christianity flourished. Christianity flourished because Christianity cannot be won by weapons. It is won by love. Love of God. Friends, I want to tell you, this is a proven history that our faith and gospel cannot be won by money, by power, by weapon, by military, or by the Senate rules. Gospelization and evangelism can happen only through love, only through the power of gospel. Friends, I want to tell you, there are so many persecutors around the world. They think that they can kill Christianity, destroy Christianity. Persecution can never destroy Christianity. That is a proven history and that is the reason why we don't take weapons in our hand. Few of our ancestors took weapon in their hands and they were proven wrong and they could not survive more than 60 years. That concept is gone. Today we have crusades, not to kill, but to save people. We have crusades, not to use weapons, but just to use all these histories of things. Friends, in a, I'm sorry, in a span of 160 years, in a span of 160 years, they could not achieve their aim of converting back everybody into Christians, to kill infidels. But in long years of 300 years and even 1,000 years, Christianity flourished not with the power of weapon, not with the power of vote, not because they were, they were great people, but they had a great God. Today, I want to tell you, friends, that is the power of gospel. Let me tell you, results of crusades was very, very different. Definitely, they integrated Arabic learning. They emphasis on the classics. You know, they could, what they, what they did. The Byzantine Empire thought by having a second military, they will be more powerful. But Byzantine Empire completely was weakened. They, you know, they, they thought that growing power of Christian church, the church could have extra power. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. They had intolerance of other faith. Remember, friends, Bible is not teaching us intolerance. We have tolerance. How we tolerate? In the love of Jesus Christ. So friends, today, as we learn this history, what I want to show you is that instead of having all these, see, one more thing what happened in Crusaders where they, they taught everybody who participated in this military, they taught this thing. If you die because of this military war of faith, you will get a special place in heaven. Like how Islam terrorists used to teach their people, if you die, you will get something good in heaven, right? You will get 72 virgins and other good things there, right? So here in Christian military, they taught if your sins will be forgiven, you will have a special place. That is called indulgence. Indulgence, they practice. And everything went wrong. Everything went wrong. Friends, this is a dark history of medieval age. 
dark history of Middle Age. And I want to teach you today that, you know, they, Muslims advanced. They thought they can kill Muslims because of the faith and kind of things and other non-Christians, but that never happened. We terribly failed between complete, complete, you know, uh, understanding of crusaders. Crusaders went to holy land. They got those lands, everything back, but everything went back from our hands. Today we have those churches there, but most of the important places are still in the hands of non-Christians. Friends, a good lesson from the history is this. We can never achieve any of those things through fight or through weapons. So if you are hearing me today right, I want to tell you, instead of depending upon politics, instead of depending upon money, instead of depending upon votes, instead of praying and expecting a Christian ruler to come, a Christian congressman to come, a Christian president to come, a Christian prime minister to come, that is not how the gospel was ever preached. I hear this kind of prayers every time. Lord, change this country into a Christian country. Let us have Christian congressmen. Let us have Christian president. Let us have Christian prime minister. And we think when they come in, all the problems will be solved. History has proven the problems never were solved because of power. The problems were solved by the power of gospel. Gospel liberates people. Gospel frees the slavery free from slavery system friends if you are bound to anything if there is anything that is that you are bonded to i want to tell you today with a proven history money cannot give you freedom power cannot give you freedom politics cannot give you freedom politicians cannot give you freedom kings and spokesmen and congressmen cannot give you freedom freedom comes from the gospel of jesus christ and today that gospel is for you Claim that gospel for you today. Through the histories, we know that. Let people punish us. Let people persecute us. Let people kill us. But they cannot kill Christianity. But we taking the power and weapons, we will kill Christianity. The teachings and the essence of Christianity is not to kill, but to be killed for the sake of faith. And that should be our faith.